All right, so we're brewing a Saison. Saisons are a very traditional Belgian farmhouse style ale. So it used to be the kind of beer that people would literally make themselves at, at their farms or whatever they were doing. Um, and it's got a lot of variations within the style. Some Saisons are funky, some Saisons are sour, and some are just plain Belgian or spice. Or You can do anything you want with it. Um, the BJCP actually defines the style as being anywhere from 3.5% to 9% alcohol. So it's got a very broad uh, definition, but basically the thing that makes it a Saison is the yeast. And the Saison yeast is different than most other yeasts because it can actually ferment at up to 80 degrees. Uh, so we're talking a very warm fermentation, which is great because my uh, air conditioner doesn't quite work as well as I thought it did. And we're dealing with about 75 degrees in the apartment here. so. Uh, 75 should be a great temperature to ferment a Saison at, and on top of that, it makes a fantastic summer beer because they're nice, they're light, they finish uh, very, very dry down below. You want to get it ideally down to like a specific gravity, final gravity of like 1.006, uh, which is what we're shooting for actually. So it's going to be a very slow, long fermentation at a high temperature, and hopefully, we'll come uh, at the end of this brew session with a really nice dry, refreshing um, Belgian beer. So we're looking to not make this too strong, probably six or seven percent alcohol. And um, we're looking to have a lot of good, nice Belgian yeast characters. Um, but we're gonna back that up with a little bit of a background, a little bit of hops. We got some Styrian Goldings and some Saz in there. And then we're gonna add a little backdrop of spices. So I have some coriander, some ginger, uh, some seeds of paradise and a uh, little bit of orange peel. So basically, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm trying to clone Hennepin, the uh, brewery Amagang's famous Saison, which is a fantastic beer, one of my favorites. Um, we'll see how it goes for ourselves. This is my first Saison ever, so it should be real interesting to find out how it works. Um, anyway, because it's so dry, what I'm doing now is actually heating up my mash water the night before. So I've already made a yeast starter, which is going right now, and uh, that should be ready in about 12, 18 hours, uh, whenever we pitch our yeast. And uh, basically, because this beer is so dry, I want to have this mash work and extract as much sugar as possible. So when I brewed a Kolsch, I did an overnight mash, and it finished really, really dry. So I want to see if I can replicate that and do the same thing for the Saison. So once we reach a uh, strike water temperature of 153, which we're actually pretty close to, uh, then we'll go ahead and dough in. We're going to shoot for a uh, target temperature in the mash of 148 degrees. And then we're going to insulate it, wrap it up, let it sit overnight, and uh, start our boil early in the morning. So hopefully this works out and uh, let's get this mash started. Alrighty. So we've got... All of my grains are mixed together, uh, so I can't really add any specialty grains first, but that's alright because the grain build for this guy is actually pretty simple. We've just got a combination of Belgian Pilsner and Belgian Pale Zuro, a little tiny bit of Munich just to bump the color up a little bit. So I'm shooting for like a, not something so light as a, uh, you know, a Pilsner or something, uh, but more like Belgian Pale Ale style color. Like a, a light golden color would be awesome. Alright, so as you can see, it's a very thin mash. Um, but it's okay because we're going to add some sugars later on to encourage attenuation. And we are right on target of 148 degrees. Alright, that's fantastic. Let's wrap this baby up 
and then go to bed. <laughs> Alright, so it's the following morning, and I uh, just unwrapped everything in the mash, and it really seems like every two brews that I do, I somehow break a digital thermometer. This was working totally fine yesterday, uh, and I didn't drop in the water or anything, and now it's just not working today. <sighs> so, can't be the battery life, I guess I just bought this thing. So that's kind of disappointing, but that's why we have analogs. Um, anyway, you pleased to know that overnight, I'm talking from about 9 o'clock last night to this morning, so almost 12 hours, it only lost about 10 degrees. A little more than that, probably. But just it goes to show that in a metal brew pot, you can insulate it just well enough that you can basically mimic the conditions in an actual mash tun pretty consistently. So basically I've completely ensured that I got full conversion out of every piece of grain in this mash. So we are going to have a very good, um, very dry finish in this beer. So I'll pull the bag out and uh, drain the bag and get started brewing. Still gonna make some coffee. So based on the amount of wort that I have in the kettle right now, just from draining the bag um, and the numbers that I have on BIABcalculator.com, it's pretty clear that I can only use about a quart of water to rinse off this grain with before we reach our final uh, cutoff volume. So I'm not even into my boil yet, and uh, already the odds are stacked against me it seems. So first my thermometer broke, which sucks, um, but at least I have backup for that. But the other thing is I made a couple rookie mistakes here. So first of all, uh, <laughs> I failed to check the alpha acid percentage on my bittering hops. Uh, I'm supposed to use Styrian Goldings for those, and Beersmith has those at about 5.4% uh, as default. But turns out the ones that I picked up from my local home brew shop were only like 2.5%. So basically, the bittering addition would have been almost non-existent, and that's kind of important to have a balanced, you know, sweetness and bitterness in your beer. So needless to say, I need to go pick up some new hops. Uh, also, uh, so I'm currently still dry hopping an IPA right now, and I totally forgot that I only have one hop bag. So I also need to go buy a hop bag out of nowhere, because I don't like to just toss my hops in the boil. Uh, that leaves a lot of chunks behind, so. Um, so we're gonna go make an emergency run to the home brew store before I even start actually boiling today, so. Woo, cheers. All right, so I went to the home brew store, came back with a, uh, a new thermometer here, a new hot bag, and an extra ounce of Styrian Goldings in the back. So, uh, we should be up to about 24 IBUs total, um, based on the new alpha acids, so. Hopefully it works out pretty well. We're gonna boil it. Um, and I also grabbed my pre-boil uh, gravity reading. It's about 1.034, um, which is actually right on the money. So uh, if you go to Beer Smith, you take out the two pounds of sugar we're gonna add later, and it's right there at 1.034 for a pre-boil. So even though it's relatively imprecise as far as the measurement goes, it's encouraging to know you're like right in the, uh, in the right neighborhood. All right, let's talk Belgian beer for a second here. Um, Belgian beer is known for its very, very strong uh, fruity, peppery uh, yeast flavors um, and smells. It's very effervescent, so you carbonate it pretty heavily. And most uh, Belgian beers commonly have a large sugar addition in order to bump the alcohol up without bringing uh, extra body. So 
A lot of Belgian beers will also have a lot of spices in them, so you'll commonly see orange and coriander. Um, and just a simple example of that is your standard Blue Moon for, you know, most people out there know what Blue Moon tastes like. That has a lot of orange and coriander in it. It is a Belgian-style pale. Uh, not the best example, I would say, but uh, it gives you an idea of what we're um, going to be shooting for as far as spices versus wheat flavor. So, um, ideally with a Belgian beer, you want the yeast to be the, uh, the king of flavor. So, you don't want it to be hoppy unless you're intentionally trying to brew something like a Belgian IPA, which is actually a thing. Um, but I digress, it's not what we're doing. Uh, we're just going to be focusing on the yeast flavor, uh, and then the yeast flavor is going to be basically painted against this background of spices. So, um, Hampen, the beer that I'm kind of modeling this off of, has four spices in it. Ginger, bitter orange peel, paradise seeds, or grains of paradise, um, and coriander. So what we're going to do is measure out our additions of those, and then set those aside. Those are going to go into the boil with five minutes left. And uh, a word on spices, less is more, especially in a beer like this. So it's a delicate, balanced beer. Uh, it's very likely that I'm gonna screw this balance up um, because it's actually relatively sensitive. Um, but you ideally want to err on the side of caution when you're adding spices uh, because they will not necessarily make themselves apparent until you start aging the beer a little bit. So. So for example, I brewed a Belgian last year that had a couple spices in it, oranges and coriander, and I went on the easy side. Um, and I couldn't taste the spices in the final beer, and I was mad about that, so I decided to brew again. Uh, so I brewed a second Belgian, similar recipe, except I ramped up the spices a lot. And in that beer, once both of them had gotten to be about two or three weeks old uh, in the bottle, the one beer that I had spiced uh, more delicately was actually a much more pleasantly drinking beer than the one that I had spiced aggressively. So, it's something to keep in mind is that these spices will manifest themselves in different ways over time. Uh, so just keep it on the easy side. You're not going to have a good uh, a good sense of what the flavor is going to be um, until a couple weeks in. So just be patient with it. Okay, so let's talk sugar now. Another common element in Belgian beers is sugar. Uh, a lot of recipes in home brew stores will call for uh, Belgian candy sugar, C-A-N-D-I. This is beet sugar, uh, basically, that's from Belgium. And uh, because of that, I think the import, probably, we have this ridiculous price tag, $5.95 for a pound of sugar. This is a simple uh, combination of fructose and glucose, which are two very simple sugars. Um, here we have regular table sugar, cane sugar. Um, this cost me, I think, like $2, and I got four pounds of it. It is sucrose, however, which is actually not as simple sugar. Sucrose, when it's fermented by yeast, has to be broken down first into fructose and glucose, and then those two sugars are subsequently eaten by the yeast and fermented, turned into alcohol. Whereas the candy sugar, the yeast don't have to take that extra step. Now here's the thing, uh, that's assuming you're pouring the sucrose or the cane sugar directly into the fermenter, which we're not doing. First, we're boiling that. Guess what heat out of water will do to sugar? Break it down. So, basically in the boil, this sucrose gets broken down into fructose and glucose, and then the yeast do the rest. So for those of you who are out there spending six or seven dollars a pound on rock candy, um, just a thing to think about. All right, so now what we're gonna do is measure out our spices. So with some spices, what you're gonna wanna do is uh, crush them a little bit. See, the Paradise is one example of that. So see these, uh, our individual seeds, we wanna actually crush them and crack them so that the water can get in and uh, extract that flavor if we want. So you have this little bowl of spices right here, which you can, um, <laughs> I wish you could smell. It smells awesome. Very citrusy and a little spicy on the outside, so. Um, with that, we're good with spices. So now what we want to do is add two pounds of sugars. So, first of all, let's get rid of this candy sugar. in the rest. Alright, so we got our boil going and uh, 
now officially going to start. So I think what we're going to try to do is use this new hot bag. Um, it doesn't come to the drawstring like my old one did, so we're going to probably figure out a new way to do it. But uh, here goes two ounces of Styrian Goldings. So now, uh, basically we're just going to wait for the rest of the boil. So um, it's a very hands-off beer. There's only one hop addition at the beginning, and then 15 minutes uh, from the end is when we start kind of frantically throwing stuff in. So uh, <laughs> wait until then. And I'll set the timer for an hour and 15 minutes. Okay, so we are 15 minutes from the end of the boil, so it's time to put in the chiller. Ouch, that got burnt fast. <laughs> So when the timer goes off, we're going to put two pounds of sugar in here and this little capsule, which is called Servomyces, which is uh, basically just this yeast nutrient that's going to further ensure that we have a good fermentation. Because um, the yeast that I'm using is known to stick uh, halfway through the fermentation and not quite complete out. Uh, it has a reputation for doing that sometimes, uh, but hopefully this, along with a starter and a high temperature, will help encourage it to go all the way through. So, here we go. Adding the sugar, you want to make sure you do it gradually. So, um, if you put it in too fast, too quickly, you definitely will end up with a situation um, where the sugar itself can caramelize and uh, stick to the brick kettle, and that's just a pain. So, just try to make it gradual, um, and it should be all right. The other thing we're doing at 10 minutes is adding an ounce of saws to our hot bag. So I'm gonna do that real quick here. I kind of like this new one. It's real quick and easy. Alright, those are your aroma hops, so um, get a nice kind of check. Finishing up. All right. Now we gotta keep stirring so we don't have a problem. We can set the timer for five minutes, which is when we're adding all of our spices. All right. So now we're gonna add our spices um, directly to the boil, and uh, don't worry about it uh, getting in your fermenter because honestly, these are just gonna actually coagulate and drop the bottom of the rest of the fruit. Uh, so you shouldn't have to worry about sucking them up and. Uh, so they're not going to get into your siphon anyway because they're pretty coarse. You're going to smell some really neat smells right now. If you could smell through the camera. Of course. Ooh. This smells really good. Okay, so I got my uh, original gravity sample right here. We're sitting pretty right at 1.060, which our expected original gravity was 1.057, so we are right on the numbers, um, as we have been actually all day. So things got better. Got a nice light golden clear wart here, so hopefully our beer looks very similar. Uh, I really like this color. So we're gonna transfer it from the uh, kettle into the fermenter and uh, let it cool down a little bit longer in the fridge, and then we'll pitch our yeast later tonight. So it's super convenient that the saison doesn't need to get down super low to like 65 degrees. It's pretty hot in here already. So we're at 79 degrees, and that's actually like the optimal fermentation temperature for this yeast. So we're gonna try to keep it around that range. Um, so I have my yeast starter, which is all ready to go. It's been uh, incubating for about 24 hours. So we have plenty of good, healthy yeast here. And uh, what we're gonna do is take a sanitized whisk and aerate uh, the wort here. So get a good inch of foam going.
All right, this next part is going to be a little bit tricky. Um, we're going to take the yeast starter. Normally, I would just dump the yeast starter straight in, uh, but there is a stir bar in here, so uh, I need to catch the stir bar before it goes into the wort and is sacrificed to the beer gods. So let's just uh, pour this very gently through the sanitized filter and attempt to catch the stir bar. I guess I just didn't need this because the stir bar stayed in. So we're going to try and ferment this beer down as low as we can get it, so as low of a specific gravity as we can. The best way to encourage that is a long fermentation at a high temperature with a yeast starter that has been supplemented with yeast nutrients, so with a well oxygenated gourd. And we got all of those, so I'm going to leave this in the uh, fermenter for actually about a month. I got a vacation plan in the next couple weeks. We're actually going to head out for a while, and by the time I come back from that, early July, we should be really good to go, um, and uh, our beer should be completely fermented, and we'll be able to bottle it. So. so I had no concept at all as to how long it was going to take the saison yeast to actually do its thing. Uh, holy crap, no idea at all. So I was initially looking at about a month, um, and it turns out it took more like two months, actually a little over two months, to actually do everything and completely ferment out. So basically what happened was the first two weeks I checked it just to see how things were going, and it had stalled at about 1.035 specific gravity. It just stayed there for a couple weeks, didn't do anything, no matter how hot I had uh, the temperature. So I left, went on vacation for two weeks. Um, I buttoned up the apartment, I turned off my air conditioning, I made sure that it got as hot as it possibly could in here. Well, it came back, and it was down to 1.012. So, better, but definitely not finished. So I let it sit for another two weeks at about the hottest temperature I could, you know, be in the apartment at um, comfortably, and uh, it only got down to 1.010 in that next two weeks. So, left for another trip, and uh, two and a half weeks later, did the same thing, you know, I buttoned up the uh, apartment and turned the AC off. Two and a half weeks later, I came back to this. And we are at an astonishing 1.001 .001 specific gravity. All right, so here's the final product. Um, so we have, uh, basically after about nine weeks of fermentation, it went all the way down to final gravity of 0 0.001. Uh, so basically attenuated as far as possible um, and as a result we have a little bit of higher um, ABV than I was intending on so we have about 7.9% ABV. Um, our IBUs were still kept down about 24 which was fine. Um, so once I reached final gravity I was able to carbonate it um, and actually carbonate it quite quickly because I figured after having nine weeks of fermentation, it might need a little boost, so I added a uh, smidgen of USO5, just some quite, uh, clean, neutral, dry yeast um, into the bottling bucket, and uh, as a result, carbonated up quite quickly and nicely, and without any sort of flavor addition. So, um, it was ready at the end of August, um, but now it's like mid-September, so we're like three months or so after I brewed it. Um, it's still great. I mean, it's probably in its prime right now. So I'm really enjoying it. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, pop the cap on for this, pour it in front of you guys, and we'll talk about how it tastes. So as you can see, I have my lovely little brewery Amagang um, Hennepin Saison themed glass, uh, which I do enjoy using. So not much head or head retention. Um, which is kind of a shame, um, even though I carbonated this slightly higher than most beers, I carbonated it up to about 2.75 volumes of CO2, which is close to the um, recommended maximum that you can put in regular brown bottles. So I didn't want to push that too hard, so it's not very, very, very carbonated, um, but it's still pretty nice and spritzy. The problem is, as you can see, the head goes right away. Um, so I think next time I brew this Saison, I might add a little bit of wheat malt, um, and that way, you know, that kind of boosts head retention. It doesn't need to be a clear beer. Um, as you can see, it is kind of a nice golden, like dark golden um, hue. So, first of all, aroma. It's, uh, it's really got that nice kind of 
Belgian yeast characteristic to it, so it's a substantially fruity kind of aroma. Not really banana-y like a Hefeweizen would be, but more of um, more of like a beer you'd expect to taste kind of tart. Yeah, and it's kind of kind of a pleasant, uh, peppery, spicy smell to it. All right, so we're gonna talk about taste next. So. All right, so it is quite bitter up front. Kind of, and that bitterness kind of goes away pretty fast and uh, transitions kind of into a smoother, sweeter, nicer citrusy kind of taste. Um, it's got a little bit of a champagne-y kind of feel to it, uh, especially because it finished so dry. Little bit of, um, yeah, okay, so that bitterness is kind of complemented by the, uh, the spices that I put in there. So you can get that orange citrus flavor from the bitter orange peel that I put into it, and you get the, uh, the Belgian yeast characteristics that kind of round that out a little bit. You get some peppery kind of flavor from the coriander and uh, seeds of paradise. The ginger I put in there didn't really come through, but it might be kind of a background flavor that I'm not really picking up on. Alcohol isn't really noticeable. Um, there's really no hot alcohol or anything in there. Um, but it's really dry, and that's like the biggest thing you notice, I think. It's bitter, but that bitterness kind of goes right off your tongue, and then all of a sudden you've got this kind of delicious beer. And it's like so dry that you kind of like want to come back for another sip. Um, as far as body goes, I mean, this is very, very, really, light, very light body. Um, it is, uh, it's a great beer. Honestly, this is probably the best beer I've ever made. Uh, it is true to the style. It's not tart um, outside of that initial bitterness. And that's, I should specify, that's not a hop bitterness. That's really more of a yeasty tart bitterness. Um, so that would, uh, having a hoppy saison is, is a totally different thing. Um, but this is more of a classic true to the original style uh, approach. Um, but yeah, this is probably the best beer that I've actually brewed to date. Um, as far as being true to the style, not being overboard on too many things, and um, overall just being what I was shooting for. And uh, I'm really happy with it. Um, if you guys want to use that recipe to try and make it yourself, keep in mind that you need to have a period of time uh, where your yeast is getting fermented at about 90 plus degrees. Um, in order to actually have it ferment all the way down to almost zero. So um, just as long as you get that in there, you're gonna probably end up with similar results. Uh, don't go overboard on those spices, like I said before. Uh, but, you know, good luck brewing this if you choose to, and um, otherwise, thanks for sticking around and watching this video, so cheers. If you do choose to brew this beer, let me know uh, in the comments below or contact me individually. I'd be happy to help you as much as I can. Um, I don't claim to be an expert on this, of course, but it worked, so, you know, that's worth something. If you got comments, questions, uh, constructive criticism especially, let me know in the comments below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Please uh, go ahead and, if you like this video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. I apologize for the long uh, wait. I've kind of sucked at being consistent and uploading these videos, but it's been a really kind of crazy summer for me. I've been incredibly busy, and it's been hard to actually get brews in, so... Um, Thank you for bearing with me, and hopefully over the next couple months here, I'm going to be a little more consistent and crank out a couple more brews, so um, stay tuned and stay on board. So, thanks for being here, and cheers.